Well, uh, today we want to welcome you to the first in a series of video um, recordings where we're going to go over some things about applying for NIH funding. Today's focus is going to be on how to read an NIH funding opportunity announcement. So when you look at a funding opportunity announcement, it's prefaced by a whole series of letters and numbers. And so today we're going to go over what do these letters and numbers mean. So the every NIH funding opportunity announcement follows the same format where there's a series of three letters followed by an IC code, followed by a two-digit number, followed by a three-digit number, and then there's a title, and then there's an activity code. The um, XXX that precedes the beginning of this number indicates the type of funding opportunity announcement that this is. Is it an RFA, a PA, a PAR, or a PAS? And I will go over what each of those mean in just a few minutes. The IC code indicates the institute or center within NIH that has written and issued this funding opportunity announcement. That institute or center is obviously participating in the funding opportunity announcement, but there may be other institutes or centers that are also participating, which I will go over a little later when we, record, when we discuss uh, the body of the funding opportunity announcement. The year indicates the fiscal year that the funding opportunity announcement was published in the case of a PA, PAR, or PAS and the fiscal year of funding in the case of an RFA. And this is important because it will help you determine the timing in which you may receive an award related to this funding opportunity announcement. The number that follows the year is a three-digit number, and this is the one piece of the announcement that is, actually has no meaning. It is just a coding system for the institute itself to track the number of FOAs they issue in a given year. Followed by that, there is typically a lengthy title, and this title is designed to give the reader an indication about what the topic of the funding opportunity announcement might be and the type of science that the FOA is soliciting. Then the um, activity code, which always appears in parentheses at the end of the funding opportunity announcement, indicates the grant mechanism or the activity code that this, this FOA will seek. And that will tell you the type of science that is being supported through this FOA. <clears throat> so to go over the differences between an RFA, a PAR, a PAS, and a PA, I'm going to go through each type and kind of go over that with you. This is a key piece to any funding opportunity announcement because it gives you a lot of information related to the funds that may or may not be available, the receipt date um, that the applications are going to be due, as well as specific review and referral criteria. And the re review criteria indicate what the review committee, the peer review committee that is going to look at your application, what they're going to be looking for specifically. And the referral um, indication is very important to determine not only the location where the application might be reviewed, but also the how it's going to be determined which institute or center your application is assigned to. So I'm going to start with an RFA because that is um, one of the funding opportunities that people tend to be most interested in. An RFA, or Request for Applications, is a formal statement of a funding opportunity available, available to the community, and it usually has a very specific focus in terms of the area of science that this funding opportunity announcement is seeking. RFAs always have set-aside funds. It is a requirement of an RFA to have set-aside funds, and the dollar amount that is being set aside will be specified in the funding opportunity announcement. Another unique thing about an RFA is they always have special receipt dates. They are not submitted on a standard receipt date. They always have special receipt dates. So you want to pay close attention to those receipt dates so that you don't miss a deadline accidentally. Also, an RFA um, 
indicates in the funding opportunity announcement the number of awards that are anticipated in response to this opportunity. So this may help you gauge the level of interest of the institute in terms of how interested they are in this area of science. Are they going to be funding one award or are they going to be funding more like 10 to 12 awards? The other unique thing about an RFA is that RFAs are typically reviewed within an institute rather than at the Center for Scientific Review and all applications received in response to an RFA are reviewed together in a review committee that is formulated specifically for that RFA. They do not go to standing study sections within an institute or CSR. They always have to have their own unique study uh, review meeting. A PA is a very general, the most general type of announcement that the NIH issues. It is a program announcement and it is a formal statement of funding opportunities available in a certain area of science. These can be new or they can be reissued and typically a program announcement is active for three years. Oftentimes with a program announcement, many institutes or centers participate in that particular announcement. A program announcement can be inactivated at any time via a notice to the NIH guide. And as I stated previously, an IC has the opportunity to reissue a program announcement. That said, program announcements are reissued the day following they are the date that they are expired. So sometimes the community has short notice um, in terms of a continuation of a program announcement. So this is something you want to keep in mind. Program announcements always use standard receipt dates. And so you will know you can find those listed on in the uh, funding opportunity announcement as well as on the NIH page. But they are typically three cycles per year and they are um, due on those standard receipt dates. A program announcement never has set aside funds. And program announcements are typically reviewed through the standing study sections, and they are spread out by content or subject area of the application rather than in response to the particular program announcement to which they were submitted. A general type of program announcement that we often see are called parent announcements. And those are the general unsolicited announcements to say, any scientist interested in submitting, say, an R01 application would use this parent program announcement. A PAR, or a program announcement with special referral requirements, is a type of program announcement that is used quite frequently. This follows all the same rules and criteria of the program announcement I just went through, meaning they're good for three years, um, they have a specified area of science, they can often be renewed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, for a PAR, there are some unique um, characteristics. The PAR has either special receipt dates, so non standard receipt dates, they may have something specific re um, regarding the referral guidelines, so they may be specifying which institute or center would receive those applications or they may have certain um, prearranged uh, agreements about where the applications will be reviewed, be that at CSR or within an institute. Oftentimes they are even um, uh, specified down to the level of which peer review study section these applications will be reviewed within. The other thing about a PAR is there can be special review criteria, which would be specified in the FOA, but you want to make sure you take a look at that review section of the funding opportunity announcement to be sure you're clear about what the peer review committee is going to be looking for within your application. The final thing about a PAR, which is a little bit unique, is that sometimes there are set aside funds within a PAR for the first year that the, uh, the FOA is issued. Again, a PA or a PAR are usually valid for three years, 
and with a PAR, sometimes there are set-aside funds for the first year, and that would be noted within the FOA itself. Um, for a program announcement to qualify as a PAR, they must have one of these things going on within the funding opportunity announcement. So either there's a special receipt date, or there's special referral guidelines, or there's um, additional review criteria, or there's set-aside funds. And there can be more than one of these, or there can be just one of these um, special criteria to make it a PAR. A PAS, or a program announcement with set-aside funds, is a very unique and, least, and is the least common funding opportunity announcement within the NIH. And the reason I say that is with a program announcement with set-aside funds, or a PAS, the only unique part of the program announcement is that there are set-aside funds. So there are no special receipt dates, there are no special um, referral guidelines, and there are no special review criteria. Typically, when an institute or center is setting aside funds for a particular topic area, they want to specify one or more of those other aspects, which pushes the program announcement to be a PAR rather than a PAS. Um, so that's why you very rarely see a PAS being issued these days. So I've kind of gone over the types of funding opportunity announcements. The next part is to really focus in on reading the funding opportunity announcement itself. This is a multi-page, lengthy document with a lot of information within it. But it's really essential that prior to starting your application, you really sit down and read the funding opportunity announcement from start to finish. The NIH over the last several years has adjusted the way in which funding opportunity announcements are written. And so you want to really focus in on some particular aspects of the FOA that in the past may have been less emphasized. And those key sections that I want to draw your attention to are the key date section, which gives you information not only about the dates that um, the applications are due, but also if late applications will be accepted, the council round in which the applications will go to, and the anticipated date of funding, so you can get a sense of when you should know that you can or cannot begin this project with NIH funding. So the other parts of the funding opportunity announcement that you really want to focus in on are mainly in part two of the FOA. So first, I'm going to draw your attention to part two, section four, the application and submission instructions. In this section of the FOA are all of the instructions that are unique to this particular funding opportunity announcement. And when I walk you through an FOA in just a few minutes, I'll point out and highlight the key areas in this section that you want to pay attention to. The third and final section that really is very important when reading an FOA is Part 2, Section 5, the Application Review Information. In this part of the FOA, it is outlined the specific review criteria for this funding opportunity announcement, including many additional review questions that you'll want to be sure you have addressed in your application. Also, there will be in this section information about the review and the selection process in terms of if there's any special criteria being applied to funding decisions for this FOA. In terms of the review, you'll want to be sure you're key into the area of the NIH where the application will be reviewed. Will that be within an institute? Will that go to the Center for Scientific Review? Will that be reviewed by a standing review panel? Or will that be reviewed by a special review committee? And all of this information is contained in this section of the FOA. And I will show you how to interpret those sections when we demonstrate the FOA in just a minute. So this, um, this next section, what I thought I would do is take you through a RFA, or request for information, I'm sorry, a request for applications and walk you through these key sections of the FOA so you can know where to look for those key pieces of information that I highlighted earlier. 
Okay, so now we're going to move to the phase where I'm going to walk you through a sample funding opportunity announcement. I've selected this RFA from NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, to demonstrate the key components with you. So as we talked about, there's an RFA number down here, and so this gives you some information. The RFA, as a reminder, means this is a request for applications issued by Mental Health in fiscal year 2017, and this number is just the count. It's the, two, it's the 608th FOA issued this year. This next section tells you all of the companion funding opportunity announcements or the funding opportunity announcements that kind of hang together with this particular one. So um, that's just some information for your knowledge. Above the RFA number is a list of related notices and this section tells you various announcements, usually policy related announcements that you should take a look at for further information regarding this funding opportunity. If you scroll down, the next section has the key dates. And I call your attention to this in particular, the application due date. For an RFA, there are always special due dates. So you wanna pay close attention to this section. And also, there is a statement whether late applications will be accepted or not accepted for this funding opportunity announcement. Many people who submit to the NIH are eligible for late submission because of service on a review committee, service on an advisory council, or so forth and so on. However, if this statement of no late applications will be accepted for this funding opportunity announcement is in the FOA itself, that supersedes your eligibility for late submission. So you wanna pay particular attention to that. The following section of the key dates tells you the time of year when the review will, the peer review will happen, when those applications will go to council, and when is the earliest start date for this particular cycle. If you scroll down to the table of contents, you'll see part two, the full text of the funding opportunity announcement. In the past, this section used to contain a lot of useful information and instructions for applicants. This is one of the major changes that has taken place in the last few years about FOAs. This section now is just that, it is background information. There should be no instructions in this section, but rather it gives you a little bit of the background regarding the targeted um, research topic area that this FOA is, is seeking applications in response to. So you should read this section, but it, is, it should not contain any specific information related to instructions for applying. <clears throat> that said, it will sometimes list for you um, things that are deemed non-responsive for this funding opportunity announcement or information that gives you some key research areas that this funding opportunity announcement is particularly interested in. So that's what I'm highlighting for you here is some um, topic areas that this funding opportunity announcement is particularly interested in. Down here is the examples of things that are considered responsive, followed by examples of things that are considered not responsive. So in this section, you wanna look for these key words in, in determining whether your application will be responsive to this funding opportunity announcement. Then you wanna scroll down to section two. This tells you the type of applications that can be submitted, new or resubmission or revision applications and also gives you a, a, a sense of the funds set aside for these funding opportunity announcements. So here it says, mental health intends to commit $27 million to fund this FOA as well as the companion FOAs. So that's important for you to know in terms of when you're formulating your budget. Section three of the funding opportunity announcement is a very key essential section. It tells you who is eligible to apply. Then it gives you information about how to apply, who can be the PI, the number of applications you're allowed to submit, 
And then this section 4.2, the content and form of application submissions, is key. You want to read this section with a fine tooth comb. Anything that is written in this section supersedes information in the standard application guide. So you follow the instructions in the typical application guide to the extent that they're there. But if something in this section contradicts those instructions or adds to those instructions, the funding opportunity announcement is the correct information. So that's very important. In this um, particular funding opportunity announcement, these RFAs, there is a section here called um, Other Project Information. And in this piece, it is telling you other information that you can attach to your application other than this, the typical things you see in the research plan. And so here, the um, NIMH is giving you an opportunity to add pages to your application. So this is key real estate in your application. And it is telling you what specifically should go in those key pieces. So you always want to look at this other project information section of a funding opportunity announcement to see if the institute is giving you any additional um, requirements to include and also additional pages that will help you get that information into your application. <clears throat> Excuse me, as you, as you scroll through this funding opportunity announcement, you see the standard research plan. In this section, in the research strategy portion of it, the funding opportunity announcement is outlining for you the key features that are required in this application. And these instructions that you see here under significance, innovation, are going to directly map onto questions that you'll see in the review criteria section. So the, the FOA is giving you a roadmap of sorts of the information that should be included and also the way in which your application will be evaluated in peer review. So you want to pay particular attention to any additional instructions provided in this research strategy section. And as you can see from this one, there's quite a significant portion. Then as you scroll through, um, toward another key section you want to pay attention to is this application review information. Here is the roadmap for the peer review process. So as you can see, we have our standard uh, review criteria of significance, investigator, innovation, approach, environment. And under each of these sections, significance, for example, you see the standard review criteria, which is this first paragraph, followed by the review criteria that are specific to this, F this FOA. And the review committee is going to be discussing each of these additional review questions in the peer review meeting to evaluate the application as submitted. So you want to pay careful attention to these additional questions. And as I just stated, each of these additional questions should be mapped on to the application instructions in the research strategy section to tell you exactly what is expected in the application. They should be a one-to-one -one comparison there. So you want to be sure and read this section carefully. Then there are also often additional review criteria listed, such as timeline and milestones. And then often, if you're using human subjects, there's always the protection for human subjects, the inclusion criteria, vertebrate animals, and so forth. <clears throat> then when you want to scroll down to the review and selection process, there is typically um, evaluation information here that will be key for your understanding of how your application will be reviewed and also selected for funding. So the top half discusses the scientific peer review process. And then the, the bottom part of this section talks about the review by the advisory council and also any additional considerations that will be made that will be used in making funding decisions. So for example, here, the first two are standard, scientific and technical merit as determined by peer review, availability of funds, and this particular opportunity announcement has added relevance of the proposed project to program priorities. 
So this is going to be key in the decision-making process at the institute level of which applications are funded and which are not. Um, you'll also want to scroll to the bottom of the uh, funding opportunity announcement to take a look at the contacts. This is who you would contact if you have any questions regarding the funding opportunity announcement. The scientific contacts are typically the program officers who wrote this funding opportunity announcement or who are very familiar with it and could answer any questions you have in terms of interpreting the information written in the FOA. The peer review contact is who you would contact if you have any questions about the peer review process, the review committee your application was assigned to, and so forth. The financial or grants management contact is the person you would contact if you had question about allowable co costs or any other things related to the budget with your application. And that takes you to the bottom of the FOA. As I said before, just in closing, it's essential that you read the entire funding opportunity announcement from start to finish, but paying attention to those key sections that I outlined for you today. Those would include the information about the um, funding opportunity num uh, number, the key dates. You want to pay attention to the funding description. And also the essential places that you want to pay attention are these application instructions. Because if you do not follow the instructions for submitting your application, that is when your application has the highest potential to be returned without review. So that's very important for you to pay close attention to those sections. I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I hope that you have found this tutorial informative. Thank you.